All right. Thank you, guys. Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8. If you want to go ahead and turn there, that's where we will land. As you're doing that, I had asked Jess and Alec to uh, share, you know, a brief testimony. I said, leave, leave us wanting more. And there's always more to tell about his story, isn't there? When I share my testimony, sometimes the Lord will remind me of something that I have never shared with anyone. And so it, it is a, a living journey that we're on. But one thing I like to listen for when I'm hearing someone's testimony is what portion of God's word did God use by his Holy Spirit to pierce your heart? How did God show you that you were a great sinner and then that Christ was the greater Savior? How did he do that? This morning, we're going to be reading a portion of God's word out of Nehemiah 8, 1 through 11. And as the word was read, God's spirit was piercing the people. The people were weeping uncontrollably. They were seeing God's greatness. They were seeing their depravity, so much so that the leaders had to say, you've wept long enough. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Turn to the Lord. Have you ever been a part of a service like that where you had to say to the people, you had to say to yourself, I've wept long enough. My joy or the, the Lord's joy is my strength. So if you're reading with us this year, you're in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, particularly Nehemiah this week. There's one divine author of all the books in our Bible, the Holy Spirit. There's an anonymous chronicler who is the human author, and at the time that this, these books were written, they were originally one book, Ezra, Nehemiah, one book. Over the years, we have divided them into two books, and together they cover about 100 years of history, from 539 B.C. to 433 B.C. The temple was rebuilt in 516, 70 years after the old temple was destroyed, the walls around Jerusalem were rebuilt approximately 440 B.C. Ezra was the Levitical priest whom God used to rebuild the temple and bring renewal to God's people. Nehemiah became their governor and God used him to rebuild the walls and to bring leadership to God's people at a crucial time of starting over after the return from the exile. Now, I hope you read through Ezra, hope you read through Nehemiah, and you noticed, if you did, that God used these two men in mighty ways. However, the renewal that God brought through Ezra and the growth and leadership that God brought through Nehemiah would only be short-lived. It would only be short-lived. And this is one of the ways that God uses Ezra and Nehemiah to point us to Jesus. There, in other words, there is no mere human shepherd, not even Ezra, not even Nehemiah, who could lead God's people to true and lasting change. God would send a shepherd who would do that. God would send a shepherd who would do that. The God-man, Jesus Christ, the good and the great shepherd. Hold your finger in Nehemiah 8 and turn for just a moment Ezekiel 34, we don't have time to read this whole chapter, but this is a summary of how no mere human shepherd could change God's people. As good as some of them were, like Ezra, like Nehemiah, the people continued to go astray. Now, some of the shepherds weren't good, and they starved God's people from God's word. But even the best of the shepherds, could not do what only God could do. And if you look at verse 11 and 12, for thus says the Lord God, 
Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep. I will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the streams and I will in, in, in all the inhabited places. So one of the ways Ezra and Nehemiah point us to Jesus is by simply saying, we're not the good shepherd. God is sending the good and great shepherd, Jesus Christ. Another way Ezra and Nehemiah point us to Jesus is, did you notice that these two men were prayer warriors? They were prayer warriors interceding for the people, acting as mediators between God and man. But the New Testament says that Jesus is the greatest prayer warrior and that he ever lives to make intercession for God's people, that Jesus is the one true mediator between God and man because Jesus is the God-man. Hebrews 5, 7, Hebrews 8, 6 speak of this. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5 tells us clearly there is one mediator, one there's one God, one mediator, also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Ezra will rebuild the temple, but it would one day be destroyed again, and that forever. It's over. Jesus is our temple, the place where we meet God, the place where we fellowship with God, the triune God. Christ himself is our final perfect lamb. Christ himself is our final perfect priest. Christ himself is our final perfect temple. Brothers and sisters, if we would meet with God in worship, there is only one place we must go. We must go to Jesus. Amen? I heard one person happy to hear that news. John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. Matthew 12, 6, Jesus said, But I say to you something much greater than the temple is here. Revelation 21, 22, In the new heavens, the new earth, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. So these are some ways that the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, the people, Ezra and Nehemiah, point us away from themselves to the good and great shepherd, the great prayer warrior, the one advocate and mediator between God and man, the one who is our temple, our priest, our sacrifice. They point us away from themselves and they point us to Jesus. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Nehemiah is used by God to provide godly leadership for the people of God in a crucial time. They're coming back from captivity. The temple has been rebuilt, but the walls are desolate. People can get in and do whatever they will. And so God uses Nehemiah to not only rebuild the walls, but to rebuild leadership. Let me just give you four quick bullet points that the book of Nehemiah teaches us. And then I want to hone in on this last one, which will be in Nehemiah chapter eight. A godly leader prays. Chapter one, verses four through 11. We don't have time, but this book begins with a bang. Nehemiah is praying to the Lord, his God on behalf of his people. Chapter two, chapter four, over and over. We see that Nehemiah depended greatly upon the great God. Ezra did the same. Ezra and Nehemiah constantly, urgently interceded on behalf of God's people. If you're going to be a godly person, you're going to be a praying person. You must not forget the privilege, the blood-bought privilege that you have as a child of God to call upon the maker of heaven and earth, the God, the one true living God, you can call upon him as father through Jesus. And you must not forget the need that is so prevalent around you. Nehemiah saw the need and it drove him to his knees in prayer. And you must never 
doubt the power of prayer. God has promised to hear our prayers and to move mightily through our prayers. I wonder how you're doing this morning in your prayer life. I know there's room for improvement. There's room for improvement in my prayer life, no doubt. Let me just ask you a couple of questions. If you really believe that God is all-powerful, that God is able, that God is your heavenly Father, and you have a connection with Him through Jesus Christ that is intimate, then why don't you pray more than you pray? Why don't you have longer prayer times at the beginning of each day? Why don't you pray more with your family instead of arguing and fighting with your family? Why don't you join us more faithfully as we seek to pray together as a church? I'm not asking you that to condemn you. I'm saying, let's get after it. A godly leader prays. Secondly, we see in this book, a godly leader acts. He or she acts. We saw that last week in the book of Esther. Listen, man's responsibility and God's sovereignty are not at odds. Mordecai believed that God was sovereign. That did not keep him from going to Esther and saying, you got to go to the king. Esther believed that God was sovereign. That did not prevent her from going to the king. We see that in Nehemiah. Nehemiah believed that God was absolutely in charge. He inspected the walls. He went out and saw the ruins and he said, I must help my people. So he prayed and he perspired. How's your prayer life? How's your perspiration acting according to the need around you? There is no disagreement between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Mark Dever puts it this way. He says, Nehemiah prayed and Nehemiah posted a guard. Nehemiah prayed and Nehemiah acted. I hope you realize that there is nothing inconsistent about doing these things together. The true child of God must pray and the true child of God must act. Are you faithfully praying and are you perspiring fearlessly? Number three, a godly leader expects opposition. Listen, anything that you're doing in this life, remember, we're not home yet. This is not our home. We're pilgrims. We're exiles, we're sojourners, we're just here for a little bit. This is not our home. Anything that you're doing that is seeking to showcase the king or expand his kingdom is going to be opposed. Nehemiah started out doing a good thing and it wasn't long. Chapter 4 hits us. People began to undermine his efforts. A godly leader expects opposition. What, what was it that gave him the wherewithal to continue? Well, he believed that God was sovereign. And that not only did not leave him immobile, but it actually mobilized him to act. But he also feared God. When your fear of God is maximized, your fear of man is minimized. Or vice versa, when your fear of man is maximized, your fear of God is minimized. Simply put, when God is big, man is small. But when man is big, God is small. And Nehemiah had a big view of God. Nehemiah feared God, and this led him to have a small view of man and a small fear of man. But the last thing I see in this book is a godly leader not only prays, a godly leader not only acts, a godly leader not only expects opposition and faces it in the fear of God, but a godly leader turns God's people to God's word. In other words, Nehemiah knew, if I'm really going to help these people, it's not going to just be about the temple that Ezra rebuilt. It's not going to just be about the wall that I helped rebuild. I've got to get God's people in God's word. I've got to get God's word into God's people. And so I'd like to ask you, if you would, to stand. We're at Nehemiah chapter 8. And this is the portion of Nehemiah that we will spend the rest of our time unpacking. And all the people gathered as one man at the square, which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. 
Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it before, he read from it before the square which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of men and women and those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium which they had made for this purpose. Look at verse 5. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. They bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Look at verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God, translating it to give the sense so that they understood what they were reading. Verse 9, then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go, eat, eat. Eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the people cal calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. All the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival, because they understood the words which had been made known to them. You may be seated. In this section of God's Word, I want to show you three things. The hunger for God's Word, the proclamation of God's Word, and the conviction from God's Word. What we have here, you might call a revival among God's people. Some might use the word an awakening. Stephen Lawson says, Throughout redemptive history, every true revival has always been accompanied by a deep conviction of sin. In these mighty movements of God, the Word of God is proclaimed and hearts are cut to the core and souls are laid bare before God. Sin that had been suppressed is now suddenly exposed and consciences are smitten and guilt escalates and deep sorrow over sin comes Conviction of sin becomes intolerable and laughter is turned into weeping and joy is turned into mourning and heaviness of heart settles upon the people like a thick fog. And in that heart-rending experience in the day of God's visitation, sin is confessed and repentance runs deep and Jesus is embraced and the soul is cleansed and forgiveness is received. In these revivals, it is a painful experience. There is no soft or easy revival because a revival brings with it an awakening to the holiness of God and an awakening to the depravity of man. Sin that has long been tolerated, excused, ignored, sin that has been minimized and suppressed, sin that has been long hidden and denied is now suddenly brought to the surface and there is weeping, there is grief under the realization that my sin is a violation to the holy God. This, Lawson says, is precisely what transpired in Nehemiah chapter 8. What we see in this passage is a prototype of every awakening, of every genuine heaven-sent revival the weeping will turn into joy, but it must first begin with a deep conviction of sin. So again, the first thing I want to show us out of this is the hunger for God's word. The hunger for God's word. These people, about 40,000 of them, were gathered, and they weren't looking at their watch. They weren't saying, wait a minute. The casserole's going to burn. They weren't thinking about the 1 p.m. kickoff. They were there to hear from God. In essence, they were saying, bring us the book. 
Bring us the word of God. And Ezra did not disappoint. But look at a few of these verses that show us this hunger. Look at verse 1, verse 3, verse 5, verse 6, verse 9. Let's just briefly look at those. Number one, and all the people gathered as one man. This phrase, as one man, means they were unified. They had one objective. They were here to hear from God. Verse 3, he read it uh, from early morning until midday. And we don't see any complaints here. Verse 5, as Ezra opened the book, the people stood up. This was their way of giving attention to God. Verse 6, not only did they stand up, they said, Amen. Amen. Or as Presbyterians might say, Amen. Amen. They lifted up their hands as though to say, This is not coming merely from Ezra. This is coming from God. We receive your word, God. Speak to us. And in verse 9, they began weeping. Listen, they were weeping at the mere hearing of the word of God, not just what they heard, but just the fact that God's word was being proclaimed. They were weeping. They couldn't get enough of it. So how are you doing with that this morning? How is your hunger for God's word? God had done something in their hearts to get them ready so that when Ezra stood up, speak, we, we can't get enough of your word. And notice God's word wasn't patting them on the back, making them feel better. We see that he was reading out of the law of Moses. That is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And they were weeping at the hearing of the word of God. read throughout the week, that will make you not less hungry. Isn't it a paradox that the more you feast from God's word, you, you don't get filled to the point of, uh, no thanks, I'm, I couldn't possibly eat another bite, to I want more. I want more. So read throughout the week so that you're not just coming on Sunday saying, feed me for 45, 50 minutes. But you've been feasting all week. You come here, you're hungry. Do what you can on Saturday night. We all know that Sunday morning, Satan's going to fight us, right? He's going to fight us. We're going to be driving into church, having a, a knockdown drag out, so that when we walk in the door, the last thing on our mind is, hey, I want to hear from God. So just know that that's going to happen and start developing some strategies for Saturday night. Go to bed a little bit earlier, lay out your clothes, you know, read over some of the text of what you're going to be hearing about. So that when you walk in, you have a hunger for God's word. Listen, why don't you pray, commit. This would be a wonderful thing to do. Pray for your elders. Pray that we will do our best to believe this book and to teach and preach this book accurately. To explain it, to walk it, to talk it. And we... We'll pray for you that your hunger, your longing for this book would grow and grow that you would not be able to get enough of God and his word. That sound like a good prayer to pray for one another? So the hunger for God's word. They, they showed up, 40,000 of them, if you go back and look at the few verses before, and they were ready to hear from God. Now, not only the hunger for God's word, but the proclamation of God's word. The proclamation of God's word. The law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. And as I said, these people were weeping. It doesn't say what particular verse it was that penetrated their mind and heart and conscience. But at the mere reading of God's word, they were so moved by God's word and spirit that they began to weep uncontrollably. But notice, and this can't be ignored, God's word was rightly explained to them. That's a great prayer to pray for your elders. I, I had a young man I was discipling one time, and he said, My preacher shouts 
and says nothing. It's not about just getting fired up for the sake of getting fired up. It's about taking God's word. We're going to see some wonderful imagery in, in the next few moments of how Nehemiah and the other leaders and Ezra and the other leaders broke God's word down into bite-sized chunks so that the people could understand what they were being taught. And that's where the power is. God's word, when rightly interpreted, when rightly applied to our hearts, God's spirit accompanies that, and he shows us great things about himself and great things about us, and there is power when God's word is proclaimed accurately. Look at verse 3. He read from it before the square, which is in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand and all the people were attentive. So number one, there was some kind of uh, estimate of, hey, you have full faculties. You can come, you can listen, you can understand intelligibly. And then on the other side, they were attentive. They were listening. There's a two-way street going on there. Then look at verse 8. They read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood what they were reading. In verse 12, we see something similar. And all the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival because they understood the words which had been made known to them. Part of this is your responsibility, church. I'm going to be honest with you. As I said, whether or not you come through these doors hungry for God or not, I can't do much about that. I can pray for you, and I want to do a better job praying for you. But a lot of that's on you of what you've done Monday through Saturday. But also, I love what Wayne Grudem says about the clarity of Scripture. He says, the clarity of Scripture means that the Bible is written in such a way that its teachings are able to be understood by all who will read it, seeking God's help and being willing to follow it. Sometimes when you say, I, I didn't understand the message today, sometimes that's the preacher's fault. But sometimes it's your fault because, A, you're not seeking God's help to understand it Monday through Saturday, or B, you're not willing to follow what you're learning. You're not willing to follow it. So I can't change that. You've got to, to put that on the altar and say, Lord, let me seek you as I read my Bible. And let me be willing to repent if you expose sin in my life. Let me be willing to obey if you teach me something that I need to obey today. God, I'm not here to play games. I'm here for you to do business with me and for me to do business with you. So in this... Uh, chapter here, we see that there was an attempt to make it clear. Unpack it. Verse 8. This word translating is maybe not the best of translations, ironically. It's a Hebrew word, parash, and it means literally to separate. In other words, to make distinctions in the text. Like 2 Timothy 2.15 says, rightly divide the word of truth. Rightly handle the word of truth. Make it clear Unpack it, break it down, explain it, interpret it, apply it. That's your elder's job. Pray for us. It's not an easy task. Stephen Lawson says, clarity can never be overrated in preaching. The word means to make plain. The Puritans used to be accused by the High Church of England of being just plain, straight-talking men out of the Bible. And they were looked down upon for this. William Perkins, who wrote their first book on preaching, The Art of Prophesying, said, Yes, we are plain preachers, and the plainer the better. In other words, they had a mindset that if there's a problem, it's not because you didn't understand what I said, it's because you did understand what I said. You did understand it. And that uncomfortable feeling that you're having right now is not because you don't understand what the preacher's making plain and clear out of the clear reading of God's Word, 
but it's that God might be exposing something that you don't want to give up. He might be showing you a little bit more of his holiness and a little bit more of your depravity, and he's moving you more and more to be like Jesus, and that's not a real comfortable process. Preachers, teachers, students of God's words, we're not just to water ski across a text and put a check in a box and say, hey, I read my Bible today. I think I've shared the story with you guys. One of the young men I was discipling at my first church, I taught him about how to have a quiet time. And I met with him at 6 o'clock in the morning at a McDonald's, and I was ready and eager to hear him tell me if he had started having a quiet time. And he said, I did. I did. The book of Romans is pretty good. And I said, wait a minute, you, you read through the book of Romans this morning? I did. I said, I think that's got 16 chapters in it. What time did you get up? He said, oh, I just got up a few minutes ago. I just, you know. And, and he, he thought, he really thought that if he just put eyeballs on black marks on white paper and turned the pages sort of rapidly, that something like, through osmosis was going to happen and that he was going to be more holy because of having put the check in the box. He was serious. He was a, a brand spanking new Christian, and this is how he thought that we are to meet with God. And I said, listen, man, I'm glad to know this about you now so that I can help you and correct you. That's not how we read God's Word. We're not just to water ski. We're not just to do the glass bottom boat tour. We are to do some scuba diving. We're to go line by line, precept upon precept. We're to understand the original meaning of Scripture before we begin applying it to our lives. And that's the engine that drives expository preaching. That's the engine that really brings a heaven-sent revival. And that's what we see here in Nehemiah 8. Don't, don't skip over that. Ezra and Nehemiah had a built-in strategy. We're going to speak God's word to these people, and then we're going to break it down line by line, truth by truth, so that they will understand it. And then as they understood it, they understood more about the greatness of God, more and more about the depravity of their heart. They began to weep. They began to repent so much so that Ezra, Nehemiah, and the gang had to say, okay, okay, that's, that's wonderful. Now, get to the Lord because the, the joy of the Lord is your strength. If you go back and look at church history, Luther, Calvin, they were preachers. The Puritan Age, preachers, the Great Awakening, Edwards, Whitfield, they were lit up on fire for God, preachers of the word. The Victorian Age with Spurgeon and Ryle, preachers. Lawson says these men were heart penetrating preachers and that's what must happen again today. Every awakening is ushered in by a new generation of men who will proclaim, thus saith the Lord. They will bring the people the book. So, the hunger for God's word, the proclamation of God's word, and the conviction from God's word. Look at verse 9. Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or grieve. Why would he say that? Because they were mourning and grieving uncontrollably. They were mourning and weeping. At the end of verse 9, he says, For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. God's word is like a mirror, and it allows us to see who we are clearly. God's word is like a telescope and it allows us to see God for who he really is. And that's important. This isn't just about showing us our sin. This is about showing us God's holiness. Look at verse 6. 
Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. They bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. I love the, the compare and contrast as they're lifting up their hands saying, God, your word is coming down from heaven. They were bowing down their heads into the ground, into the ground. James Montgomery Boyce calls this the teeter-totter effect. You know how it was when you used to get on the old uh, seesaw, right? One person goes down, the other one goes up. It just ha happens that way. He says, both ends can never be up at the same time. It's one or the other. As God is exalted, man is humbled. When man is exalted, it is as though God is dethroned. So here we see God's word being brought in a clear, reverent fashion. Hands being lifted up, the people standing up. Ezra saying, I pray to the Lord, the great God. And this had a twofold effect. It magnified God and it brought the people down low. How low? It says that their face was in to the, or to the ground. God was doing something special there. I hope that God's doing something special right now. Listen, I, I looked... They, they met for hours, and not once here do I see that they were checking their clock or worried about the casserole in the oven. They couldn't get enough, even though it brought them tears. One pastor said this, In most churches today, the goal is to keep anyone and everyone from ever getting to this point. We just want everybody to have a good time. We just want everybody to feel real good about themselves. It's as though the pastor is the captain of the love boat. I'm okay. You're okay. Let's just all have a great day. But in Nehemiah 8, the law of God is revealing their sin. The law of God is revealing God's majesty. It's shocking. It's startling. It's troubling. But at the same time, they didn't, they didn't want it to stop. The people had to tell them to stop. To stop the weeping. The weeping time is over. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Verse 10, he says it again. Do not be grieved. Verse 11 says it again. The third time, be still. For the day is holy to the Lord. Do not be grieved. Wouldn't it be a great day if we had to patiently, lovingly look to our neighbor to the right or left or front or behind us or even in the mirror and say, you know, you, you've, wept, you've wept enough right now for your sin. Yes, your sin is great, but the Savior is even greater. Look away from sin and self and look to Jesus. Wouldn't that be a great day? That'd be a great day. Listen, God's word, when accurately, when effectually read or heard, heightens our sense of divine accountability. It heightens our sense of human responsibility so that we confess, we repent of our sin, we desperately seek Christ, we continue to pursue holiness. Charles Spurgeon says there will be no dry-eyed revival in the church. I mentioned Whitfield a moment ago. Let me read something that I, that I found this week about one of his preaching endeavors. On February 17, 1739, George Whitfield preached for the first time outdoors outside of Bristol in a field where coal miners and their families gathered to hear God's word. Foul, foul living, foul speaking coal miners, unconverted, rough they gathered to hear Whitfield in an open field preach the word of God. They would never go to church. And Whitfield writes, having no righteousness of their own to renounce, they were glad to hear of Jesus who was a friend of sinners and who came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Whitfield said this, the first discovery that I saw of their being affected by the Holy Spirit 
was to see white gutters made by their tears which fell down their black cheeks. Their face was black with soot from the coal mine, and as they came to hear God's word, he noticed these white gutters streaming down their faces as tears streamed down their cheeks. He said, these were rough and tumble men, but they were under conviction that their sin, their sin had been paid for by Jesus. That Jesus had died, he had bore their sin, he had suffered under the wrath of God for them. And that through Christ alone, a door of mercy was now open. Whitfield said, I was able to share with them that if they will repent of their sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. And that evening, scores and scores of these sinners ran to Christ and found a glad reception in Jesus. They all came, he says, weeping under the conviction of their sin. Then the joy of the Lord, which is their strength, relieved them and sustained them. What a great, great testimony. I wonder what is God saying to you today? We've met, we've heard some testimonies. We've prayed, we have sung together. We've heard God's word read, we've heard God's word preached. What has God said to you today? And by his grace and for his glory, what is your response? I'm not trying to scare anyone, but just to speak frankly, this may be the last sermon you ever hear on earth. Can you guarantee me that it won't be? This may be the last opportunity that you have to do business with God and plead that he would do business with you. Do I have your attention? talking first to the Christians. Surely God, through his word in Ezra and Nehemiah, has stirred you to pray more frequently, to pray more fervently, to pray with more faith. This is one application from God's word that surely God aims to massage into our hearts and transform us to be more like Jesus, the ultimate prayer warrior. But not only to pray more, but to act more consistently and to act more fearlessly. Remember, where God is small, man is big and vice versa. So what might God be leading you? What action might God be leading you to take this week? Where you work, where you play, where you live. Start with prayer, no doubt. But how might God be moving you to act in some courageous ways? that would showcase the Savior and expand his kingdom. Surely God is moving you to get into his word more often. Not just Saturday to do a crash course for Sunday, but every day spending time in his word. Remember, a godly leader gets God's people into God's word, gets God's word into God's people. Surely God is moving in your heart today to say, spend more time with me in my word. And not only that, but look around you. Who can you get to get into the word of God with you? You guys have been praying and don't stop now uh, for my mother and our time in Cave Spring. And it's been a tough time. It, it has been a very difficult time. But one of the sweet, sweet fruits of that has been our times where we turn off the TV, we silence our cell phones, we open God's word, and not only the Wells family, but we say to my mother on the couch, Nana, get into God's word with us. And those have been some precious, precious times. Just recently, she said to us, when we don't do that, I miss it. Which, if you know me and you know my love and my prayers for my mother all these years, was about the best thing I could have ever heard. 
because it shows me that God is truly working in her heart. She has a hunger to spend time in God's word. She's providentially hindered from coming and joining us. But she wants people that would bring the word to her. Christian, I encourage you in these ways. Unbeliever, whether you're listening to this sermon from your couch or whether you're here right now, unbeliever, I'm speaking to you. Flee to Jesus. Do not delay. Flee to Jesus. Jesus is the meeting place with God. Repent of your sins. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Take your sin seriously because God does. But take the Savior seriously because God does. He sent the Savior to be your shepherd because he knew that no mere man could change your heart. But Jesus can. Jesus can. No one giggles through the narrow gate. No one skips and whistles through the narrow gate. We must repent. We must flee to Jesus. You can only know the joy of Jesus after you've first known the sorrow for your sins. Let me say that one more time. You can only know the joy of Jesus after you have first known sorrow for your sins. Let's pray together. God, you are the same today as you were in Nehemiah and Ezra's day. Your word is the same. Your spirit is the same. Your desire to seek and save the lost is the same. Your desire to revive your church, I'm sure, is constant. And so I'm praying, God, that not because of who I am, but because of who you are and because of the power of your word and your spirit, that today, through this message, you have saved unbelievers. You have revived your people. And you have glorified your name. You did it in Nehemiah's day. Won't you do it in our day, God? For the sake of souls and for the glory of Christ, our King. Would you do that among us today? We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. And God's people said... Amen.